I sort of feel like um, following Diane, I, I feel like the time I went to a Sonic Youth concert and Nirvana opened up. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, all right, so here I go, but I'll do my best. Um, so um, I'm coming from a very different perspective in terms of being a chair at a university like Loyola Marymount University, but I am a product of a UC. So I was a UCLA undergrad. I went here actually to UC Santa Barbara as a freshman. I transferred to UCLA. I then went to uh, UCLA graduate school. Um, I remember being a graduate student and thinking I had to be my advisor. And my advisor was a huge name in art history. And by the way, no one in this room knows his name, right? <laughs> so I studied with Donald Preziosi, who wrote a book called Rethinking Art History. I studied with Amelia Jones, who was a feminist art historian still writing about performance. But there comes a point when my ego had, I, I had to let it go, because not everyone can be the big name in, in the field. Um, and so I think that Diane really hit it right on the, hit the nail right on the head in terms of when you are applying for that teaching job. And by the way, Loyola Marymount University wouldn't think of their faculty positions as teaching jobs. But when you're applying to a place like LMU, you're not a failed UC graduate student. You are a successful UC graduate student. Not many people get into UC Santa Barbara for whatever fields you're in. And just navigating all of the requirements to get your advanced degree is remarkable. So take that with you. And the funny thing about life and the funny thing about success is that it's constantly shifting and changing. And it's always out there. It's, you will never reach it. But if you are aware enough, you can at least enjoy the journey. So I think that, I think that Diane really hit that. Um, who am I speaking to, by the way? And, and this will be the theme of my talk. So I'm curious, how many humanity, humanities graduate students do we have here? Okay. Um, social sciences? Okay. Education? Okay. Um, the sciences? Okay. All right, so it's a nice mix. Did I, mi did I miss anyone? Okay, good. So, and, and this is the reality of um, higher education now and in, in terms of these disciplines. And I sort of date myself, right? Like I'm from art history, but really art history can be, today you could have a communications degree, you could have um, a degree in classics, you could have a degree in so many other fields, so thank you. Um, know your audience, so when you are applying, wherever you are gonna end up, know who you are speaking to. Um, and it's good that I know that now. Also, another um, important point that I wanted to make was that your journey is your journey, right? So my journey was my thing. Um, I remember thinking that I was breaking all of the rules. My advisor didn't want me to be an adjunct professor when I was, an ev I was maybe a year past my master's degree. And I just decided that I needed to work not stud, you know, not go to the library and read. I needed to work. I needed to have that interaction. And I remember my advisor saying, why are you doing that? You need to publish, publish, publish. And just, I couldn't do it. I, I was not going to finish the program. I needed to have a job to go to. And so that's my story, right? But your, your journey is going to be your journey, right? So I'm, we're just here giving advice, and hopefully you get something from it, and probably what you'll get is that there's not one path to success, all right? Um, and again, as you'll see, success is constantly shifting, right? So where you are is where you are, and just ride it, right? Be in the moment. Um, my second piece of advice is get your foot in the door. So Diane had mentioned that she, most likely she's going to hire someone that has more than a teaching assistant experience, right? Get your foot in the door. Um, what this means is that, you know, if I were a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara, um, I would be looking at the local institutions, whether that means Westmont, whether that means Cal State University, Channel Islands, 
whether that means Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Hancock College, Santa Barbara City College, Ventura College, Oxnard College, CSUN, right? I would be willing to drive to CSUN. Uh, Cal Lutheran University, I'm trying to think, Westmont is close by, right? Call, your call those departments, see if they have opportunities for you. Follow up, be present. Um, what you're looking for is the opportunity to get teaching experience because that's what's going to distinguish your cover letter, your CV from, the, from your colleague, from your fellow graduate students at other great universities that only have teaching assistant experience. Um, right. By the way, I am famous for talking off my notes, and so I want to make sure because I, uh, this is usually the way that art historians give PowerPoint lectures. We use them like slide projectors, and so I can talk, 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 and just forward, and I know what's coming, but this is one of the first talks I've given where I'm going to have text coming, so I want to make sure I'm <laughs> doing that. There it is. Okay. Um, so advice, too, about, about getting your foot in the door. Make sure that your CV is accurate, clear, and concise. Right? If you are applying to LMU for a lecturer position, meaning full-time, non-tenure track teaching position, usually that means 4-4 teaching load. Um, the tenure track faculty have a 2-2-2-3 faculty, or excuse me, 2-2-2-3 teaching load. So over two years, you are going to teach that sequence of courses. But a full-time teaching job, where it's, where it's not about research, that's a 4-4. Uh, make sure that your CV maybe leads with teaching as opposed to your research, okay? Make sure that um, your contact information is correct. Now, I said that I have a PhD from UCLA, but I am a student of uh, the School of Hard Knocks. And I learned the hard way. <laughs> I learned the hard way of writing a wrong phone number down. Well, you know, just a typo. And I, 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 I was on the job market, and I was wondering, why aren't I getting callbacks from these schools? And so this was back in the day when it wasn't all email. Oh, my God, oh my God I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right? And, and, and like when I caught it, it was, are you kidding me? But it was a, it was, it was a typo, right? It was an eight instead of a nine. Okay, so the school of hard knocks. Now, it all worked out, right? I am where I am. I'm really pleased where I am. However, God, to this day, I'm like, oh my God, like I wonder what I missed. <laughs> so I can't stress that enough. Um, make sure that your references support you. And I'm sure Diane can speak to this. You would be surprised how many people write a reference or have someone write for them that is not 100% supportive of what they are doing or where they are going. Now that's a hard one to find out. Um, but if you are applying to positions or fellowships and you are consistently unsuccessful, it might be time to look at your references. And it, you are in the right to ask your writers, do they support you 100%? And Diane, I'm sure that you can. Yeah, I think what's absolutely what you're saying about your experience with your advisor, what he, he or she is not supporting you fully, they want you to be supported. That's right. That's right. And I was lucky that I sort of taught behind his back, and his letters were always supportive. <laughs> but I did, have a, I did have a letter writer who was my third reader on my dissertation that it was only, and this was for internal fellowships, right? So applying for funding in the department. For a year, I wasn't getting anything, and then I didn't ask this faculty member, and I started getting things that I had been um, unsuccessful before. Um, and so then, you know, so I figured it out. Um, but you would be surprised, right? So definitely make sure that your references support you. Um, stick to it, right? So I had mentioned all the local universities where you could get teaching opportunities. Um, Check back in, right? So I, for example, I have a possible adjunct faculty who uh, wrote to me in September. I wrote back to this person and explained that we didn't have any openings at the time, but please check back come May. 
And this person wrote to me again, and now this, you know, he will probably have a class for the fall, right? So check back in. Don't take the initial rejection as a rejection. Um, be persistent. Be respectful. You'd be surprised at how often an adjunct position just emerges because someone got sick or someone went on leave or, um, you know, they got promoted to another position on campus and now the chair needs someone to fill in. And sometimes it's, his, uh, it's just, oh my god, this email just came in. I'm going to call the person. Um, there are a protocol that all chairs have to go through in terms of the hiring process. But again, it's about getting your foot in the door, right? So being persistent, respectful, and present. Um, and then also these resources, right? Ask your advisors. Oftentimes advisors, your graduate advisors might be able to call someone at Westmont or call someone at a local university where they can just pick the phone up and say, hey, I have this great graduate student that's advanced. They need um, some teaching experience. Um, and so that makes a difference. Again, the local colleges, classmates, um, that's important as well. I don't know how it works um, up here on the Central Coast, but I know that LMU, it seems almost every adjunct faculty member is from UCLA, right? And it just so happens that a lot of the full-time faculty are from UCLA. And so there's this network that, um, that emerges. Um, I've, you know, and I'm sort of speaking to a generation that you are familiar with wikis. And again, just by, like when I say that, it feels so unnatural. <laughs> wikis, whatever that is, I know that, th I know that there's an art history wikis job site, right? And I sometimes check it to see what's out there. And then also, um, I have a good friend who is now teaching at an independent school, so a secondary school. Um, and he asked me to put this in my presentation. Carney Sando, I believe, is a placement firm, right? And this is an opportunity. And I have a daughter who's a junior in high school. And when we were looking at independent schools for her, I remember he sitting and hearing um, the faculty give their presentations and thinking, this is pure. This is pure teaching. And this is. Um, a smaller environment in which they're more nimble. They're able to change curriculum much faster. They have an audience that can't go anywhere, right? They can't walk out of class. They are there to hear you speak. Um, and so um, I've often thought that, you know, this is an opportunity that if I had um, had the opportunity in the past or even in the future, I would pursue. Um, so this idea of knowing your audience, um, understand that every university has a mission statement and that these mission statements are for you um, to understand and to definitely uh, use as frames and lenses when you apply to these uh, places. So LMU is not Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo is not UCSB and Santa Barbara City College is unique as well. So in your cover letter, make sure that you're addressing the mission of the institution. But as was brought up in the question and answer, try to understand what each university has to offer and try to frame what you've done um, so that it speaks to that, right? Um, I do believe that all um, institutions of higher learning have similar missions of educating the whole person, right? And the idea isn't to make everyone PhD students in psychology or in art history, but there's usually um, a humanistic component to it, right? To be broader citizens in the world. Um, so how do your quali uh, so uh, how do your qualifications fit within the job description? How will you fulfill the needs of the department? And how do you have connections, right? So in your cover letter, try to address these things. Um, the connection to the institution and locale, you'd be surprised. If, um, let's say, your wife or your partner went to school at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, 
and you're applying from somewhere else, it's not a bad idea to conclude with that, right? Like I have a connection to your university, my partner was an undergraduate major in this field. Um, if I were applying to UC Santa Barbara, or if let's say there was a job opening, I would reference that I was an undergraduate here, right? That I'm familiar with the place. I'm familiar with its mission. Right, and so I took these frame grabs. Now speaking about Loyola Marymount University, its mission is very much rooted in its Jesuit identity. Um, if, you're, if you're unfamiliar with a university's mission and if it's connected to a church or to a particular, um, let's say, public university system, l learn about it. Um, <laughs> I am not Catholic. Um, I'm not Christian, right? And so when I applied to LMU, I had no idea what the Jesuit mission was. And I naively, uh, when I interviewed, thought that I understood it. Um, now having been at LMU for close to 15 years, um, it's a mission that's rooted in social justice. It's a mission that's rooted in this idea of the whole person, educating the whole person. What I learned, uh, Preparing for the interview was that the Jesuits were usually at the forefront of social justice issues, right? So though I couldn't speak to the religious component, um, I could speak to aspects that I truly, truly believed in, right? Um, and so that's important, right, to understand that when you're writing to an institution, try to, try to learn about it. Now, there are certain schools where that's not the case, I'm not gonna call them out, but they're more fundamentalist in terms of their religious perspectives. Or they require their faculty to sign religious faith documents. Really? Yes, you'd be surprised. And I don't wanna, I mean, can I say certain school names? Yeah, sure, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think, okay. I don't think that they're embarrassed about it. Mm -hmm. If you end up having to sign something, you don't get a job. Right, so I have a friend that teaches at Pepperdine. Yeah. And she um, now, <laughs> So that's a school that's a Church of Christ. Now that's a school that they don't demand that you're a Church of Christ member, but they demand that you are active in your religious community. And she signed that document. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, Westmont might have a similar. I wouldn't be able to teach there, right? So I, you know, I could try to fake it, but you're not going to make it. No. <laughs> um, the UCs have a unique mission as well, right? And the UCs being the uh, University of California, right? And so if you're applying, whether it's a research position, a tenure track position, a teaching position, if you can speak to the mission of the UCs, the UCs have a beautiful you know, central mission to, to the citizens of California, right? My dad was educated through the UCs, right? Without the UCs, many people don't go to college, don't have the opportunity. Um, to succeed, right, to find their paths. So, so the UCs have such an important mission. And it's something, too, that I think that wherever you end up working, you want to be part of that team, right? And, and so I would have, ha I mean, oh my god, what, you know, walking around this campus, I, I would have happily taken a job at UC Santa Barbara, and I would have uh, been really proud to be part of the mission. Now, the same thing with the, with the Cal States. Now, um, Diana mentioned, I don't know, a smaller? You had said something? Right, some of them are small, some of them are small. Right, and yet it's the, it's, the, it's the country, it's the nation's largest public school system, the Cal State system, right? And so again, when you're applying, or if you are applying to the Cal State system, um, they too, right? Even, probably more so than the UCs, right? It's all about undergraduate education. Um, so definitely, and these mission statements now are online, right? It's as easy as just taking the time to Google this stuff. And then, obviously, um, the community college uh, environment is unique as well. Um, always remember, uh, when you are writing that cover letter, how do you fit, how can you contribute, and how can you expand what they're doing? And so in your cover letter, if you can get that across, so that a search committee, when they're going through 80 to two, you know, 100 applications that yours stands out. 
Common mistakes, simple typos I mentioned, addressing the incorrect school. You would be surprised. Oh, we know. Right? <laughs> it's the same thing when you applied to graduate school. Probably you had your statement of purpose, and it was the same, and then you had a last paragraph and a first paragraph that you tried to remember to change. Really see myself at UC San Diego. Yes. <laughs> That's right. So that, that, will, that will automatically sync your application. If you can't get it together enough to know that LMU is not Santa Clara or that UC Santa Barbara is not UC San Diego, um, don't overstate your qualifications, but be confident in what you've done. Okay. Um, the blanket bombed cover letter that sort of goes to this idea of the address, no reference to mission or fit. Um, if you can, try to have your cover letter on letterhead. Stay connected to your department, um, whether it's your graduate department or if you are adjuncting at, at a local college, right? Use their letterhead. Um, I think that that makes uh, the cover letter more professional. And just remember that the search committee is looking at a lot of applications. And so it's, it's sort of easy to see the blank, unletterheaded cover letter and to just overlook it. Whereas that beautiful UC crest is, that has weight for sure. Um, the phone interview. So if you're lucky enough to get your foot in the door and you get a phone interview, again, know your audience. Usually you can ask who will be on the search committee. Do research. Um, know that if you're speaking to Diane, know her research. Right, And so that when you're talking about your own research, you can reference hers and how they fit. Um, in a smaller department like LMU, that's pretty easy to do. If you're applying to a university that has five art historians, it's, you're going to know how you fit in relation to them. So know them. Um, highlight your strengths. Right, Don't be negative. Um, uh, definitely talk about your teaching experiences and approach. Be, uh, be prepared to discuss your classroom successes and challenges. Challenges, not failures, okay? I think Duke Ellington had said every problem is an opportunity or every failure is an opportunity, something like that. Um, that is so true, right? Um, so you are going to be asked about your teaching experience. You are going to be asked about successes and they might say failures, but try not to Talk about failures. Talk, talk about challenges and how you've addressed them. Um, highlight your research. We ask about research, right? So LMU is a 40-40-20 in terms of tenure track positions. We're going to talk. We're going to ask you about research. If you can frame what you are researching, and so the particulars of your field and your subfield, but if you could talk about how you've integrated your research into your teaching. Um, that will always be helpful. Be enthusiastic and speak clearly. Um, you would be surprised. Probably not, but you're going to be nervous. I'm nervous now speaking to you. I feel as if I'm stumbling here and there, but I know that I'm excited about being up here, and I know that I want to tell you something that will be useful, and I know that as, as, as an audience, you're going to be more accepting of my stumbling and nervousness and maybe a brief stammer here and there um, because I'm enthusiastic about what I'm talking about. So in a phone interview or a Skyped interview, there's nothing more awkward than Skype interviews. Just remember that they are asking you about your teaching and your research. I don't know about you, but my family, they don't care about my teaching and research. So <laughs> take it like that. Oh my god, these. Three people want it. They want to hear what I have done, what I'm doing, what I want to do. Why not? Go with it. Just be excited about it. Um, be prepared with questions for the committee. Every interview, every phone interview will end with, "Do you have questions for us?" So here's some here's some advice. Ask questions that demonstrate your interest and knowledge of the position and institution. So for example, I know you're looking for someone to teach the modern art survey, but would there be opportunities to develop new courses? I see you haven't offered a contemporary theory course in the past few years. Would this be a possibility? Right? That shows the search committee, look at that. They've looked at our course catalog. They've seen what we've offered. This person really likes us. Now for a school like Lola Marymount University, that's 
stroke the ego. Why not? <laughs> that is important. Maybe less so for UC Santa Barbara, right? No? <laughs> OK. Um, so looking at online course catalogs, um, I saw that there are team taught courses between the history and economics department. How do these classes get developed? I've always wanted to create a class that would be taught with dance to address contemporary performance. Something like this, right? It's showing that, again, you are interested in what you're doing, how you would fit, how you could offer something to the department and university. Um, do, do faculty take advantage of off-campus resources? And then, um, Diane, you mentioned this, this idea of uh, you had, a, you had um, a recent lecturer who developed the psychology club, right? So, you know, it's pretty amazing that I was thinking about this, right? Because, yeah, something that would contribute, something that shows your awareness. Um, common mistakes of the phone interview. Lack of preparation or understanding of search committee's needs. Overstating one's experience. Because I guarantee you that if you are overstating your experience in the classroom, there's going to be a question from the experienced search committee members that will expose it, right? And it's, that, that's never a good look. Um, the inflated ego, again, know your audience. You know, every faculty member at every four-year institution, guess what? They're, they're from big shot universities too, right? So maybe less so with the UCLA or UCSB PhD, but boy, when we do interviews with Ivy League PhDs and they're coming at us like there's something more special than what we are or have, that's, that's just not a good fit, right? That's, that's just not knowing um, their audience. Um, rambling or incoherency doesn't help, and I'm smiling because I'm hoping that I'm not that person <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, and asking questions. Don't ask questions that put the search committee on the defensive. So for example, many times because we are a Jesuit university, a question will come up about Catholicism and about well, you know, is the church, are they going to um, edit my classes? Are they going to censor what I have to say? That just shows such a lack of understanding of the Jesuits, right? So, but I understand how someone could get to there. But if you do some research, if you know going into it that the Jesuits are not beholden to the, to the, uh, to the Pope or to the diocese of, of LA, right? It is an independent university that has a Jesuit mission. So um, don't put the search committee on the defensive. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a campus visit, again, prepare and pace yourself for a long day or two. Um, you will have an interview with the search committee. You will have an interview with the broader faculty of the department. You will have a teaching demonstration, oftentimes a research demonstration on top of that. You will be interviewed by the dean. You will meet with students. And in between all this, you are having coffee, lunch, dinner with the search committee, with different groups on campus. It is a long, long day. Um, I think that part of this is to see how, how are you going to survive. It's the resilience. It's their. Yeah, right. Um, so, so don't get too high, don't get too low. Understand, again, if you stammer at the start of your teaching presentation, you're going to have so many opportunities to demonstrate other strengths or um, to come back to it, right? Common mistakes, lack of preparation, excessive negativity, inability to improvise. So, when the PowerPoint doesn't work, don't yell at the IT person. Deal with it. Roll with it. Just teach, right? Uh, remember the campus visit is your chance to demonstrate how you would be as a colleague and act accordingly. Um, after the interview, always write your thank you emails. Follow up with any information that you couldn't provide during your visit. Be patient, right? Sometimes you're the second candidate. That doesn't mean that you're fantastic. It just means that someone else was a better fit. However, that person might take another position. And then you're up and no one will remember that you were the second. Um, be reflective. If you don't succeed, try to go back and figure out why that happened. Okay, maybe I need to have more teaching. Maybe I need to integrate my research with my teaching. 
stay positive. And, you know, I saw I had a minute left in, so this is where I am. But I want to thank you, and I want to thank, um, you know, thank you, Diane, for your presentation as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you for this. Uh, I want to ask a question about the last slide that you had, and you, you said, you know, learn from your mistakes, or when you did, when you don't get a position, you know, try to learn from yeah. that. Um, can we ask the committee what we, what they were looking for that we you, could? Yeah. Improve? So you can, but don't expect a response, because because oftentimes these searches, um, the committee, there are certain rules like we can't. You know, it's um, like the search isn't officially closed until the person starts their position. Um, used, right. I was just going to say, the society is so litigious. Yeah. It's very difficult. It's such a weird system because it's a crucial time to get feedback and no one will give it to you. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I would suggest again, it, here's a place to use Nambu. Can you could? If you know, if your or your advisor knows somebody, you say, you know, can you just tell me how did it go? Right? Yeah. Right? I've got a student who's been on three job interviews and she was the runner up every time. And so I was able to talk to somebody and just, they just said, you know, she's fantastic, right. but she hasn't got this. And, you know, maybe next year she would have that, or you're really doing something wrong. But, but it's very hard to get it officially. We're, we're in the same boat. Yeah. You graduate student applications, right? Nobody will tell you why you didn't get in. That's because right. Because if we say you didn't have X, then you could be sued because it's supposed to be a holistic evaluation. X, X by itself shouldn't have made it. Are, are there ways around it? Can we ask for a phone call, you know, where we yeah, can you discuss? Know what? <laughs> so, I think, so I think that when I put that on there, really it's more self-reflection. Okay. Right, and, and, and to try to be more strategic. But like, if you are getting close to jobs, that means that you are doing something right. Yeah. You know, because it is, again, just to get a phone interview is remarkable. Um, every job has so many applications. So yeah, so I'm sorry that, OK. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, you seem like a really safe person to ask this question, okay. so I will. Um, <laughs> No, I'll answer I've been it. surprised by the number of institutions that are associated with religions. And okay. um, like some of them I was looking at, like Methodist Church or uh -huh. Jesuits or other yeah. Catholics. What would you be Googling or searching for on those institution websites to figure out if it's an institution like yours yeah. or one that's more like Westmont where you might be signing something? Right. So I would first you know, just start with the mission statement. Then I would do research on the order of the church, right? And I'm, I'm not a theologian, right? So I'm sort of speaking. So if it's a Jesuit, if it's a Franciscan, if it's a Church of Christ, it's a, if it's a Methodist, do research on those orders um, and see what their politics are, and then look at course catalogs, right? So for art history, I know, well, if they're not teaching contemporary theory or performance, you know, they're not, they're not teaching contemporary art, right? If it's only Renaissance and Baroque art, and there's no non-Western art, right? There, you know, the, there isn't the you know courses that are looking more globally. Then, then I know that that's a more conservative place, right? So maybe you know I could imagine that if it's biology, right? You know, wouldn't that be interesting to see what courses? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's where I would start there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned for the references that you had an advisor who was a little less than enthusiastic about yeah. teaching. And I'm kind of in a similar position where my advisor's like, it's R1 or nothing. Yeah. And is it fishy if you don't have your advisor as a reference for teaching jobs? Like, does that look bad? I think that is, yes, it is. Yeah, and I'm sorry to say that. And so, so I was saying that my advisor was suspicious of the teaching jobs, but then when I was on the job market, he wanted, his, he wanted his students to get jobs because that would reflect poorly on him. Uh, but I think, can I just say that? Because I get this all the time. Like, I want to go teaching, but uh, my advisor is against it. He or she will write me a bed, and I'll never get anything in the field. 
And, and I think Damon's making a really good point that that graduate students don't understand is that faculty are evaluated on their placement of the students as well, which is partly why they all want you to go out loud. Right. Uh, but they want you to be in a place that is using your PhD and that is a great institution. Right. And so they don't want it. And I, you know, I, I, I find it, I know that there have been rare occasions that I've seen this in my 100 years in academia where people write a negative letter, okay? Or they say, this person is solved, okay? If you're, if you're trying for an R1 research position and your advice is in, your research is solid, that's not good, right. okay? But most of the time I think in teaching, in teaching things, your advisor just either isn't enthusiastic or doesn't know what he mm -hmm. or she is talking about. I agree that it's fishy if your main advisor is not among the letter writers. But if you're in that position, I would do a couple of things. I would go to them mm -hmm. and tell me if you agree from you know, your work here in the community. I would go to them and say, look, I know this might not be the career path that you have chosen for me, but it's really important. I want to represent the lab well in this position at this institution. Please bear that in mind when you're writing your letter. Yes. Okay? And it's not, it's not just all about the research, it's about how I taught, you know, look how I mentioned all the undergraduates in the lab. Look how I, all the 199s I had. Look at the honest students that I up with. Look at the courses I've taught, blah, blah, blah. Please consider that. And then I would make sure that your other letters Right, it's more enthusiastic. Right. Right? I, I hear Lisa writes letters. Uh, all my students are going to be going over. <laughs> but, you know, if you've worked with Mindy or Lisa, if you've done things, if you've worked in the team, uh, if you've been the instructional development consultant, you know, then, then it's quite appropriate to get letters from those people connected. But there are other faculty in the department who are supportive of teaching. In almost every department, not in every department, but in almost every department, we have a faculty member who is on the board for CICA. Those people have made a statement that they support teaching. So find out who they are, get, and get them your information, and try to get them to write for you too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, what I should say too is that my advisor was unsupportive of teaching while being a graduate student because he wanted me to finish faster than I did. He wanted me. To Yes. <laughs> we'll go ahead and take one more question um, because I know some people have to get home before traffic and all that good stuff. Yeah, so I was just curious. Um, I guess t speaking about teaching experience, um, instructor of record is a bit more challenging to get mm -hmm. um, at UCSB, especially if you have like external funding, you're very limited about okay. how much you can actually teach. Yeah. And so I guess my question is how on your search committees is that kind of weighed into consideration if like the bulk of the teaching experience is TA ships, but we've completely flipped classrooms, we've changed curriculum and kind of, we've done a lot to mm -hmm. develop the course as we've yeah. taught it year to year. Um, and how so to I kind would, of include that. Yeah, in so I would frame that. I would also look for opportunities to be guest lecturers mm -hmm. in yeah. your colleagues' classes. And there's lots of places to go around and yeah. try and get it outside. The yeah. 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 I don't think that NSF cares if you teach a class at West Mont in the summer. They won't even know. They're not allowed to have a teaching appointment yeah. here, but they won't even know. Yeah, yeah. And, and that said, um, there are those candidates that don't have extensive teaching experience and they have other strengths and then come the campus interview or the phone interview that comes out and you just get a sense of this is a born teacher, you know, this is someone that has that enthusiasm and I hesitate to say born teacher because I don't think we are born teachers, I think we, we become good teachers, right, so I want to stress that, you know, Again, if you stammer, if you stutter, if you're shy, you can, you can overcome all of these things. And the more you do something, the more comfortable you become. And that's another reason why when we're hiring teachers, the more experience that someone has as a chair, I know, OK, they've had these questions. They've had the student that pushes back. They've had to deal with all of these um, issues that come up every semester. Yeah. 